thanks everybody for being here. I'm very, very excited to learn about the work you're doing, the challenges we're facing. Um, but I really want to have Allison tell us what we're here today. Thanks, Naraj. Uh, thanks for joining everyone. Yeah, we're here to talk about technology and the needs that we have to use technology and innovation to solve our biggest conservation challenges. Uh, we've known for a long time that there's a lot of great tech and innovation happening, but there hasn't necessarily been really great opportunities to integrate that into our conservation and really the work on the ground. So that's what today is about. Exciting. Well, I'm excited to hear about the challenges that, that have been and how your work drives the tech that hits impact for us. So maybe we'll start off with some quick intros. We'll start off with you, Alison, if you can introduce yourself, and Chris, and then Carrie. Thank you, yeah, I'm Allison Cohan. I'm the Statewide Terrestrial Director for the Nature Conservancy's Hawaii and Palmyra Chapter. And what is the one thing, that, that one big thing you're working on right now? Just a quick snippet. <laughs> uh, well, I'm working to save Hawaiian forest birds from extinction. Uh, there's a few species, four species in particular, that are in dire imminent um, threat of extinction within the next 10 years. So working on some biotechnology and other ways that we can save the forest birds, including just the most basic, let's preserve their habitat and make sure they have what they need to survive. Thank you. Yeah, Chris Balzoli, I work for the Nature Conservancy as a natural resource manager, and um, I'm on the, located on Hawaii Island. And uh, so one of the big things that we're really focused on is protecting the watersheds. And so we put a lot of our energy into maintaining the forests that collect the water that then goes through the system, Malcolm Mackay. Okay. And I'm Carrie Fay. I'm the project manager for the Maui Nature Conservancy. And um, along with Allison, I'm also working on the bird project. And we also have a preserve here on Maui that houses two of those really endangered birds. So we're doing on the ground management also. Amazing, amazing. I'm going to focus the next question on Chris and Carrie, and then Allison, maybe you can zoom us out to our, our goals. But maybe you can describe quickly just what a typical day looks like for you all. So, Chris. Typical day. Yeah, so a, tip, a typical day is quite varied for our team. So we do everything from we'll fly drones and we'll monitor, you know, as we've got some diseases in our trees that we're monitoring how that's progressing. We'll be on fence lines fixing fences. Um, we'll be tracking ungulates and trying to figure out where they are, what they're doing. We to the level of working with sea turtles down at some of our other preserves that have um, habitat for turtles. So it, it does range from very simple day-to-day -day tasks to pretty complex technology use. So the Maui team, um, we do anywhere, anything from weed work to animal monitoring and surveys, um, mosquito work, endangered species work, and you know we escort researchers into the field, um, checking fences, building fences. You, um, yeah. That's pretty amazing. All that field work, all the work that's happening from planning, hitting our groundwork, hitting you know impact on the on, on the ground, really, it's just amazing. Um, Allison, if I were to flip that a little bit and see how that work ties into our 2030 goals, if you could throw a little light and you know helping us see that path. Yeah, at the Nature Conservancy, our 2030 goals are about connecting nature and people, uh, pr protecting lands, waters, and oceans, and biodiversity, and and tackling climate change. And really all of those things hit the, the ground really clearly and hard in Hawaii. Uh, we're, we're seeing climate change impacts you know, every day and we have for a really long time. We're seeing really extreme weather events. With the, uh, the changing climate, we're having some invasions of invasive species that are really hard to temper. And we're trying to adapt to that and we're trying to adapt the environment to that. And of course in Hawaii, unfortunately, we're known as the endangered species capital of the world for good reason. We have species going extinct and um, plummeting towards extinction every day. Uh, so we, you know, we don't have years or decades to tackle this. We have days and weeks. And so we need action now on this. That means, that means there needs to be help from not just conservation, but potentially technology. And I'm sure you've, you've played with quite a bit of that. Um, I would love to hear, and the audience would love to hear, how technology might have impacted your work. Just a couple quick examples. 
Yeah, you know, one thing, uh, the reason I kind of started thinking about technology was related to our invasive Himalayan ginger. It's a really just rigorous, prolific plant that's being spread by birds and um, via the ground as well. It's impacting the watersheds. And I was looking at, we need, we need help to figure out when to take action, what kind of action to take, and actually when to abandon our efforts, right? When are we just spinning our wheels and spending millions of dollars that could be going to, hey, say, protect the forest birds. So looking at ways that we could look at our workflows, automate some of those workflows, and get some help making, uh, making decisions. Chris? Yeah, so technology for us ranges, again, from like, very operational things like GPS units, and we've got some mapping that we'll do, and uh, we've got applications that we use to collect data that, that's pretty smooth and flows, and all the way through to um, using game cameras, bioacoustic sensors to track both what we see in the forest and what we hear in the forest, and it gives us a full picture of the health of the forest. And then we even experiment with other stuff that's not quite as operational, like uh, environmental DNA, eDNA, and we look at being able to use things like that to be able to even see more of the forest health through what we find in the water. And so, yeah, we, we range a lot of stuff. That's just a little bit of it. We fly drones um, as well quite a bit to track changes. Um, we've even gone in the not operational side, but experimental side, we're looking at doing more 3D rendering. So we do, um, they call it structure for motion so that we can look at 3D um, how our coastal ways right now is where we're using it the most is how it's changing. As we have this, as Allison mentioned, how we have climate change, sea level rise. We want to know how that impacts the species that we're trying to help protect. I love the magic word experimenting. That's a fun <laughs> one. I want to tap into that in a little bit. Gary. So, yeah, on the ground, we are using drones with forward looking infrared sensors. So, we're doing, we're looking at animals and surveying for animals using that technology. Um, we also use a lot of trail cameras and game cameras, so we get a lot of images. Um, and then we have um, some high resolution aerial imagery that we've been using, and uh, we've got an array of networked weather sensors that we are um, kind of in the beginning phases of it. We've got a few out there right now, and it's all connected to a dashboard live. We'll talk about more of that of that soon. That is cool. That is very, very cool. Well, as a technologist, when I hear this, there's a lot of opportunity. But I'm sure reality strikes quick. And, and I think with all the work you do on the field, with the elements here, just being here the last couple of days, understanding the work you do and seeing it happen and actually sweating it out, <laughs> um, you kind of appreciate a whole different level of the work you're doing and the work that it takes to save our planet. So I, I'm sure there's challenges that are not just, you know, making an AI model work. So maybe if you can throw some light, Alison, we'll bundle it back to you. A um, couple of challenges you've run in, into trying to bring tech into your world. Yes. Well, first and foremost, it's where to start with bringing tech into the world. Like the Himalayan ginger problem, it's like, well, we need help with decision support science. We need help with imagery. We need help with machine learning. Uh, but one of the, uh, the lowest hanging fruits, so to speak, was, you know, first we had to find these plants, these little bits of green in a sea of green. And can AI help us with that? And so we thought, cool, great, we have this um, imagery. We have satellite imagery, we have imagery taken from drones. We'll just run that through and sure, AI should be able to help pick out that plant. No, there's just, you know, there's lighting, there's the resolution, there's the angle. Any day in Hawaii, it could be cloudy one minute, sunny the next hour, raining the next hour. And so getting that to be taken into consideration, the machines to figure that out and automate that was really tough and, uh, you know, hasn't quite worked yet. Chris, what do you think? Yeah, for, for us, one of the big challenges is really automation and scaling up the ability of our team to do more. And so we have a really great team that knows where to put the cameras, knows where to put the, the bioacoustic sensors, have, have really good knowledge of the land, but we don't have the time or the abilities to go through thousands of hours of data to find that nugget, to find the movement of the bird patterns, or to find, um, to go through the images on the cameras and find 
you know, whatever specific species we're trying to track, there's a lot of noise in all of that. And so with small teams, we just can't, we just can't do it. So for us, one of the biggest challenges with technology, that's kind of the hardest thing for us is that we find something that works, but we can't scale it. So I would say automation kind of leads to scaling. So scaling is the ultimate goal, but for us, it's the automation is the biggest choke point. Let me, let me double click a little bit on that for you a little bit sure. on scaling and understanding, you know, from the operational standpoint, has there been a something you might have tried that didn't work? Yeah, yeah, we've, we've, we've definitely, um, so going to the bioacoustic sensors, so those again are microphones in the forest that allow us to listen to the birds, we, we track insects, um, and even some of the invasive species. Um, we put out the, the recorders and then we had a citizen science project that was gonna help us out with that. Um, everyone was excited and we got the data and it was in a very short period of time we had 3,000 hours worth of data to listen to and listen to real time and so we had people that started to go down that path and we very quickly realized that it was an overload for our citizen science team and so what we found is that there's this missing pace. We, we, if we could clean that up a little bit and pass to the citizen science a smaller data set, a more concise data set, then I think that we can really leverage um, the citizen science, the place-based learning, and the technology, and, and the work that we need to get done in the forest to understand it. That's, a, that's an amazing nuance. When we think about technology, we're always thinking about these big, big solutions for, for big challenges. But when you look at workflows and automation, especially accelerating your, your, your work at the point of impact, that's a big area for us to double click on as technologists, just thinking about ways where we can contribute to the challenge, to the, the problem. Gary, what about you? Yeah, so again, the biggest challenges, um, for me being somebody who works on the ground in the field, um, my final product, it's been challenging to get that final product. I want a map that tells me where these endangered species are or where the non-native plants and animals are, you know, or a shape file or something that leads me to it so that I can go take care of it on the ground. Implementing it is a huge kind of a tripping point or, um, and, and also the data collection. We have collected a lot of data and then it's like the analysis. How, how do we analyze this? And, you know, I think that's kind of what everybody is trying to figure out, right? Yes, yes, absolutely. Um, we want to flip the question on technology now and actually make it about what it can do for you. Maybe a little bit of a wish list. Um, just thinking about the overall community, right? You've got technology companies, vendors, partners, innovators, researchers, um, people that are experimenting with new innovative tech. What would your dream or ask would be in, in, in what can they help you with? What, you, what would you ask them to do for you? Ooh, that's a tough one, Niraj. One, two, three um, things, because okay. I can see that. Well, first, let me one. tell you just a little pie-in-the-sky scenario in my mind. So you've got a drone that has software program that has a machine learning algorithm that's somewhat that's proven somewhat effective, but it's still learning. Um, and so you set this drone on Transex, it comes back to you and tells you these are particular areas that we think this plant may be, and you can go out and take <clears> care of that. It's also still learning and refining the algorithm. And that predictive model is getting better and allowing you to adapt your management over time every day. Then you feed it into a different type of an AI program where it's helping you make decisions. Some decision support science using AI would be really helpful. Yeah, I think for me, Allison hit it on the head. It's for us, it's being able to manage real time, right? Adaptive management. And so, as we deal with climate change and shifts, I think for us, it goes to kind of what we already talked about. It's about if somebody could help with the lift of the workflow of automation or bridge the gap even between, we have really great researchers that we work with all the time and they can get an idea working with us even to a place where it seems possible. But it's to, it's to bridge that last gap where it takes it from something that's a proof of concept that might work to being something that's operational, that we can deploy with our team and we don't need to have like a full set of scientists to help us actually deploy it. We can go out and we, we can de deploy whatever that technology is. And it works with a lot of things for us, but for me, it really is automation. And I'll give one quick example. And so with, with the birds again, um, we're very interested in our native birds. A lot of them are critically endangered, endemic. 
and we have climate change, we have shifting patterns, they're moving their patterns, but it's hard to get that information about where the birds are and where they're spending their time. And so if we can have these bioacoustic sensors out that are feeding us really quickly what's going on, then if we're doing something in the forest or if something's happening in the forest that might be affecting the movement of those birds, we can maybe change what we do and we can, we can match our management to what we want um, or, or what's best for the birds. Well, not to harp on the Himalayan ginger, but <laughs> that is the one thing that keeps me up at night. It, it's a really a habitat modifying weed, it spreads easily, and it's being found in the most remote forest. If we could find a way to find it, first of all, we've tried using aerial imagery and you know, it's, it's an understory plant. Um, so it's really hard to see, and maybe that's not the answer for that particular plant. Maybe there's different technology that we could find. Um, that's really the one major thing that would be great. The detecting things or understanding alerts that happen or surveying and prioritizing regions, I mean, these sound like jobs to be done that a technology should really come in and play with. Plus, the learnings the conservation tech team can really pick up on is see how that applies to other programs. Because I'm sure there's other folks in other programs that are potentially stuck in similar workflows where automation could help accelerate something or analysis that can help us get to some answer quicker. And if we can learn from what's happening here and translate that, I think that's an area that really excites me as a technologist, but also as somebody that's connected to other programs at DNC and the work that we're doing on a broader scale, um, how this becomes a learning epicenter for, for things that are happening on the field and how our work touches everything that DNC does. I, we're officially at the end of the panel. I have mm -hmm. another pie in the sky. I like that. <laughs> okay. Go for it. Well, I, it's important for folks to understand like Hawaii is incredibly unique, right? Incredible biodiversity and endemism. Uh, one way that we can preserve that is by you know dealing with our invasives. Invasive ungulates or hoofed mammals are very detrimental. They spread weeds. They also there's a very strong correlation between a deadly pathogen to one of our most important trees, the ohia. Uh, there's a there's a major link right with these ungulates and this pathogen. So we need fences. Fences are really important to keep these animals out. If we had some nanobots or little robots that check these fences for us, fly, they, automat they automatically avoid obstacles, and they transmit that data, ideally real time, to the cloud, because we have big wind events, again, related to climate change, things that are causing these uh, fences to be broken, and then animals get in, and we're talking millions of dollars that have gone to waste now that these animals are in the forest. So we need, that's a low hanging fruit, maybe for the right technologist, let's do it. I like that. We call, we, we call these ideas moonshots in the tech space, but because of our work here, we, we need to call them earth shots. These are very relevant, needed, we need to bring them and touch these tech to that idea. That, I want a big idea from you, I want a big idea from you. Give, me, give us a big idea. Crazy. Like a crazy idea? Yeah, let's do it. <laughs> yeah, so if we shift it over back to the, the drones that, that uh, Allison was talking about, I think kind of what she was talking about is a wish list. If we could really get flights over our forest, whether it be drones or small airplanes that were real-time feeding data, or close there too, and, and we could really get ahead of some of these things. I mean, what if we could detect um, invasive species the second they get into, or just right away, right when they get in there? We can pull those, like the ginger, before it takes off, before it goes. You know, a lot of times we don't find there's a new invasive species until it's already a problem, and at that point a lot of times it's too late. So yeah, if you had something that could really do that kind of detection really fast, I mean pie in the sky, or, or earth shot as you call it, that would be pretty spectacular. Yeah. Like a smart watch for the planet. There you go. Mm -hmm. there you go. Uh -huh. Excellent. Okay. Um, a drone that can treat weeds. Yes. Because we have weeds that occur on cliffs, it's impossible to get to the weeds. Um, you know, we have a few ideas with uh, paintball guns floating around, that's kind of in the works, but a, if a drone could do it, that would be really neat. It's awesome. It's and you know, I'll just chime in real quick that we know that there are drones that treat weeds, right? On the mainland, in Iowa, and places like that. So we need these adaptive drones, right? They can sense the terrain, 
um, and someone that can help us get through the regulations to use that here in Hawaii so we can shoot from drones, shoot weeds from drones. <laughs> <laughs> it's a very relevant idea and I think, I think that's anything that accelerates your workflow and that's really what the tech is supposed to be. I've uh, heard it multiple times this week and I've seen it and I've felt it, what Mark and I have. It, work comes first, tech comes second. And that is something that I'm stealing from somebody in the crowd that you'll hear from. Um, but that is absolutely the sentiment that technology should have. We need to work together with science, iterate together. I think our collaboration on the, the Ginger project has been iterative, has been an effort in understanding and learning fast, and that's something that tech brings to the table. Learnability, uh, the, the mindset of a learning you know, process, and doing that with the lens that conservation is the goal. Um, in 2030 is our compass, and we're going towards that with you know, strong collaboration on the ground, strong collaboration with science, our local teams, our folks, our, 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 our the people component of it. So I'll leave it to you, Alison, to close us out here with a final call to action. This has been great. Yeah, well, I, I encourage us all to, to get out of our bubbles a little bit and think pie in the sky and have these brainstorming discussions with folks from other sectors. We need academia, business, private, nonprofits. We need us all really coming together to solve these, I mean, huge challenges that are facing, that are causing the health of our world to, to decline. Um, it's not just us looking for cool solutions. Us, it's us really trying to make the world a better place. Okay. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Sarah. Mahalo. Appreciate y'all. Yeah, my name is Patrick Hart. I'm a professor of biology at the University of Hawaii at Hilo, and I'm also the PI for the Listening Observatory for Hawaiian Ecosystems, or LOHE Lab, at the university where we work on a number of biological questions relating to sound, and particularly bird song. Like many people in this room, one of my goals is to prevent the decline of Hawaiian birds. Um, and so one of the best ways to do that is by improving the ways that we can monitor where they are and how many of them there are. So trying to get a better understanding of their distribution and abundance. And so for decades, we've been going out into the forest once a year and in, you know, taking very trained people and going out there and you just spend one day a year and, and you count at one station. Um, for eight minutes and you try and count all the birds in that spot and you use that information to tell you what's going on with the birds in that entire forest. And that's just not a very good way to monitor bird populations. And so we need to use technology to improve the way that we're doing that so we can manage them better. And so in the last 10 years, there's been the increased use of automated recorders that you can place in the forest and just record the songs that the birds are singing all day long throughout the year. And birds are, you know, the birds, especially in Hawaii, are making, are, are singing all day long, oftentimes. And so we can use that sound to get a better understanding of where they are and how many there are. But the problem is that it's just the, the amount of data that's generated from these automated recorders is just massive. And it's almost impossible using current technologies to analyze all this data in a reasonable way to get an understanding of what's going on with the populations. And so we've been collaborating in our lab with the Cornell Lab of Ornithology to improve a new algorithm that just came out. It's called BirdNet, which people can actually download to their phone to identify bird songs in mainland areas. But it doesn't work in Hawaii, and it doesn't work for research or monitoring purposes anywhere yet. And so we've been working with them to improve the algorithm through coding competitions and giving them lots of annotated data that we've been employing students in our lab um, to help with. And so we're just right now at the point where we've got this algorithm that's ready for, you know, ready for research to use in Hawaii. And so what we would like to do is work with folks from Nature Conservancy and other um, agencies throughout Hawaii to uh, improve um, sort of the, the, the way we um, monitor them in the forest by creating these networks of artificial recording units or ARUs and then hopefully um, yeah 
being able to understand what's going on in the forest in real time by having them transmit the data to central agencies and we can use these uh, algorithms to monitor who's, what birds are singing at which recorders and so we can get a much better understanding of where the birds are and how many there are and also how they're doing over time. So you can look at how many birds are singing um, at this time of year in one location, compare that to all these future years to get trends in distribution and abundance which would be just orders of magnitude better information than we currently have uh, for, for managing our endangered bird species across the state, really. And so to me, pie in the sky is to just get more affordable units and to just greatly expand this network of listening devices that we put into the forest. I've been working in this field for a long time and I think that there's so many um, great opportunities to expand the use of technology and this is just one of them and I'm just really excited to work with all of you in this. I think the drone efforts are also incredibly exciting as well so I'm just happy to be a part of it right now. This is my goal for the next five years is to just you know make our lab and those that we collaborate with this center for getting a better understanding of, of Hawaiian bird distribution and abundance across the state using these new technologies. Hi, I'm Dr. Kim Flinsky. I'm a coastal and estuarine science for the Hawaii and Palmyra chapters of Nature Conservancy. Marine systems are a little bit different in that they're, they're changing at a different time scale, but I think there's also reasons to do rapid assessments for marine environments. We're working today in our chapter on reef insurance, um, a product that would help us protect our reefs in, a, in the occasion of a hurricane or other big storm event that would come. And after that storm event, we would need to be able to quickly identify where the reef was most vulnerable. So that's one type of rapid assessment. Um, things like fire are also really impactful for our soil erosion. When you have a fire, it really takes out all of the vegetation in a place. And so if we could post fire, either identify those fires immediately on happening, so how can we have quick fire detection, or post fire decide, okay, how, what's the best way to rehabilitate this place by getting good imagery in one place at a time. So those are just a couple of examples that would go from the upland or Malka side down to our, our oceans to, to really quickly identify problems. It takes an awful lot of energy to get large-scale spatial data sets, for instance, on the scale of the Hawaiian Islands, given all the different idiosyncrasies for our environments, the cloud cover, other types of problems that go with that imagery. But if we have those large-scale spatial data sets, they can hence help us answer really big questions that are limiting our ability to do management. For instance, if you, right now, it's kind of up in the air still, the impacts of how sediment will interact with coral. Is it going to prevent the coral from bleaching or is it going to scour the coral? Is it a good or is it a bad? And there are times when there's still people that can't decide whether you need to use, like go after that particular type of source. So if we had a statewide data set that could be combined with say our statewide coral health metrics, which we've also been working on, then you can overlay the two and do the statistics to figure out how important is this particular driver for coral reef either health or decline over time. So those big data sets are really feeding into big scale science that we've been working on to try to answer the most critical questions that will help direct our program. The last piece that I think is is important to realize is knowing who your data is for. Um, in the case of upland management, it might be easier. It's to try to get rid of the species that are threatening our forest, whether it be mosquitoes or Himalayan ginger. But when it comes into peopled environments, it's a little bit less clear as to who the data is for. Is it going to be for the academic community to make those big scale decisions? or is it for your county council member so that they can promote the work that's going to lead to the policy changes that you need. And so figuring out how to address different types of data to different types of audiences, I think is key to our conservation success. My name is Mark Gearing. I'm with the Nature Conservancy. I am principal for emerging conservation technology. So I am working on a lot of different technology projects, mostly as a consultant and a few hands-on. Um, you know, one of the things I'm really interested in and have been focused on a lot is using something called the Internet of Things or IoT, which is you know, a buzzword for basically connected sensors that send data directly to the Internet. Um, I think there's a really exciting possibility. There's so much going on in the world of like smart cities, smart agriculture, where, you know, this technology is being used to, you know, measure inputs and outputs. Um, smart cities are using IoT to get a better understanding of water usage. 
um, really to a fine detail. Having all this data in real time allows them to sort of really model and monitor in real time what's happening with their water systems and then they can better control and better understand. Um, ultimately, it allows them to like, predict use. Um, what might happen on you know, Thanksgiving Day if there's a storm next year? What's our water usage going to be look like? Or what's our electrical usage going to look like? So there's a huge amount happening in this space. And I'm really interested in the idea of can we bring some of this technology into our preserves? Um, could we use this to actually better understand our ecological systems, our water, our temperature, and really look at this you know, in, again, real time to better understand, you know, first what's out there. Um, and really developing actionable information, you know, very, very, in, in almost real time, um, so we can make decisions. Um, so much of, you know, our research and our data collection, we're learning things after the fact. Mm -hmm. If we can bring in that data, not only, you know, of course we save time with people going out to the field to collect things. Um, really, you know, that alone probably is worth it, but that's really just the beginning. If we can have this data, and analysis and even predictive capabilities, I really believe there's so much we can do. And given there's already industries that are doing this, if we can borrow that technology, we don't have to rebuild it, we don't have to create new things, we can adapt it to our needs. And I'm really excited about that. And that's really been a focus of mine. You know, there's another buzzword, the digital twin, which is the idea that we're modeling, using data to model a real thing. And you know that's come up a lot, and I'm really excited. Could we create a, a digital twin of our preserve, for example, where we have all this information that modeled in real time and actually adjusting the models as we get new information? Um, I, I really think that would be an exciting thing to help us understand our ecosystems, but then be able to make decisions and how to improve things um, over time. Yeah, you know, I'm a very pragmatic technologist, and I like to find things that help people really hands-on in the field. And in my discussions the last few days, I've been hearing a lot about fences and all the challenges of monitoring and managing fences to keep out the ungulates and the you know, species that we, we don't need to be there. So that's really like, I I'm really want to find a way to find a smart fence and find a way to help you manage and understand when your fences are up and when they're down so that you can get, you know, I want Carrie to get a text on her phone that tells her where the fence is down. Um, it's not like the super, you know, it's probably not gonna get any, anybody too excited, but for, for me, that gets exciting because, you know, that makes Carrie's team can spend less time sort of just walking the fence and more time doing, you know, more higher value things that they're totally capable of doing, like monitoring species and removing species and, you know, removing invasives. Um, so that's sort of, you know, my mission coming out of this is looking about, learning about smart fences and seeing what we can do to help there. Hello, my name is Ryan Peroy. I'm a professor in the Department of Geography and Environmental Science at the University of Hawaii Hilo. I'm also the director of the Spatial Data Analysis and Visualization Research Laboratory. We use technology in a number of different ways in the research lab. One of our primary focuses is to look at uh, applying geospatial technologies to local problems of environmental significance. So we use a lot of GIS, we use a lot of remote sensing, um, and one of the primary methods of remote sensing we use are using these drone platforms or you know, unoccupied aerial systems. Um, and we uh, use an array of different types of sensors on these to uh, collect imagery of the environment looking for um, changes to forest health, looking for invasive species, um, but more and more we're actually starting to use these to do more active um, applications where we're using drones to actually sample vegetation. So those are some of the you know, applications of technology that we use in, in, in the research lab. We also, from the imagery that we collect um, for the problem of invasive species detection or endangered species detection or whatever it is you're interested in, we're using artificial intelligence to basically, you know, sift through the thousands and thousands of images that we collect um, to uh, be able to detect the species of, of interest or concern. And so I've got a number of people in my lab who are their primary, their primary activity is developing these different machine learning algorithms for different species of interest. A big problem in Hawaii has to do with the availability of um, of imagery in some of the areas that we care the most about. Um, so in some of the areas of, of native forest, there's 
There's not very much imagery. It's cloudy all the time. And unlike the mainland where there are national programs where they map every year for the um, national imagery uh, program, uh, we don't have that here in Hawaii. So that was a big surprise to me when I first moved here was just the lack of imagery. Um, and so we have been working to solve that with the use of drones and we've, um, but with drones you can only cover tens of acres, hundreds of acres, you're really pushing it with current technology, you know, a thousand acres on a really long day, um, but it's quite challenging. Uh, we've, to get around that, because a lot of the problems are problems of scale, uh, we now use sort of manned aviation, um, primarily helicopters, uh, to map larger areas where we can get at thousands of acres or tens of thousands of acres, and even in some cases, hundreds of thousands of acres. We also use satellite remote sensing to get at some of these things, but there are some spatial uh, scale issues that come to play. Um, a a pie-in-the-sky uh, need or, or vision that, that I would have um, would be to have basically long endurance, um, manageable, meaning something that could fit in the back of an SUV, uh, drones that could fly for 10 to 12 hours and are able to basically cover you know, large watersheds or even entire islands on a pretty regular basis. Um, and there are some FAA regulatory things that are, that are currently sort of limiting that becoming a reality, but that's getting closer and, and, and closer. Um, so basically long endurance drone uh, that's able to regularly image some of these areas that we care the most about. I think that is, uh, could be a, a pretty big game changer for us. Uh, right now, we've been working hard to uh, develop a, a number of uh, algorithms for particular species of concern. So, Myconia calvescence and um, Phaia tree and some other agroforestry species. But we have a relatively small number of species that we have artificial intelligence detection algorithms for. And I would love to have artificial intelligence algorithms for all of the species that we find in Hawaii, both the native and the non-native species, so that anytime you image something, you can run it through the algorithms and they would tell you exactly what all the different species are in the imagery that you, that you acquire. And I think that's definitely doable. Um, it's just a matter of you know, building up the training sets to, to, to make that happen. Um, yeah, so I, I have a lot of reactions to what you guys are saying. Um, so, so we... Uh, Another issue that often comes is the, the turnaround time between the imagery acquisition or the data collection and the analysis to get at a, 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 a product or that's actionable. Um, and so we've got that in mind. The, the machine learning algorithms can certainly help with that. And we actually have a, a project on Hawaii Island right now where um, where we fly a drone uh, looking for an invasive species. The drone lands, we run that imagery through the laptop in the field. The coordinates get kicked out and those are given to the field techs, crews who can walk back into the forest while we're already out there and then take those plants out. Sort of, you know, same, same operation. Uh, not having to wait a long time for that to occur. Um, so that ability to sort of, you know, turn around the information really quickly. Uh, that's one that we're working on. I think there's, there's a lot to be done in that, in that area. Um, my lab doesn't currently have uh, these, but there is a lot of exciting things happening right now in terms of um, drones that can fly through the canopy. So drones that can fly through forests and avoid you know, tree trunks and, uh, and map out the sub canopy. And I think that is an area that um, there's a lot that could be done here in Hawaii in particular. Um, so, so that's certainly one that, that is, is pretty exciting. I have some colleagues at ETH Zurich in Switzerland that are working on some things like this, and other people are as well. Um, in terms of uh, monitoring fence lines, uh, again, those that exists, but you get into sort of an FAA regulatory problem where you're flying beyond visual line of sight. Um, but again, the rules are starting to ease for this. And so I think, again, it's about, I hope, it's about to turn where this will become much more readily available to do. So one of the things that has been amazing this week for us is to see how conservation and technology can collaborate and iterate together and work in partnership. And we need to smallify these big challenges together. And for that, I think it's just been, you know, the collaborative mindset, the let's try something quickly, learn something quickly in advance towards our mission 
has been a big piece of the puzzle. Um, love to see what else we can do with this relationship together and this partnership together as conservation minds and technology minds. Yeah, absolutely. You know, we really have a lot to do, but it's adaptive, so we need to keep trying things and, you know, honestly keep failing to learn those lessons. So we really need, you know, technologists uh, to come to us, say, hey, I've got this, and maybe I'll help you try it out, tell me what they can do to improve. That way they're also helping to conserve nature and do something that we can all better the planet for. So that would be amazing. And you know, we do need donor dollars to help fund this work because it's really scalable. We can scale big nationally, internationally to do better conservation faster. Thank you.